Um, my father, I was born in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam. My father was born in the city of Zwolle, where his father was a doctor. And he graduated uh, with a PhD in law and was working in an office in Amsterdam when he met my mother, who was born in Eastbourne, here in this country, and had been uh, gone over to Holland to study there. And they met in a park when she had a puncture and looked pretty miserable, and he mended it for her, and they looked into one another's eyes, and that's why I'm here today. Um, with the rise of Hitler in Germany, many German refugees came over uh, to Holland, hoping that they would be safe, and my father was commissioned by the Dutch government to start up a, a welfare organization to help these people find homes and work um, so that they could mingle with the, with the Dutch community. Um, when the Germans invaded Holland, that um, funding stopped, and he had to work very hard to get Dutch Jews to help their German co-religionists um, to survive. He joined the Dutch resistance. He spent many times trying to find hiding places for Jews to hide. We even hid Jews in our own home from time to time. Jews hiding Jews, that's something you don't come across very often indeed. He also was a link in a chain that people who had false papers made for them would come to his office for legal advice, and by that time he was only allowed to give legal advice to Jews, and these papers would get him through Holland, Belgium, and across the Alps into the safety of neutral Switzerland. And it was one morning in October 1942 um, when he left to go to work, and we never saw him again. He was betrayed. The security people took him away from his office. He went to the SS headquarters on the Wetering Schans in Amsterdam, from there to the notorious camp at Amersfoort, where he was beaten and tortured, and from then on to Westerbark. And after a short while there, he went on to Auschwitz, where he was murdered in the gas chambers on the 21st of January, 1943. So very close to our own Holocaust Memorial Day here. My mother was suddenly on her own, and she started to show some of her incredible strength and bravery. And on one instance, she actually met my father in the prison, having pl changed places with one of the cleaners and had gone in there disguised as a man, leaving three children behind. That must have been a remarkable feat to do something like that. Three of my father's friends petitioned the German authorities for clemency for my father. He was an up-and-coming lawyer. He was definitely destined for high places in the legal system. They... Um, pleaded with the German authorities. This was a very dangerous thing to do. After all, they were pleading for a Jew who was in the Dutch resistance to boot. The, Jew, the Germans wouldn't relent, but due to um, persistent, uh, persistency by them, we were put on one of the um, several priority lists that the Germans had set up in Holland um, to stop mass panic among the Jewish population, promising all sorts of things which, of course, were never kept. Um, and then one day we got a letter to say we, were to, we had to leave our home, report to the station to be sent to this special camp uh, where we would be remaining for the rest of the war, which of course didn't happen. After six months in this back camp, it was called Bernefeld, a castle it was, that had been requisitioned. We were then transferred to Westerbark, the main big transit camp, where we really began to see what was happening. Transports would leave every, every week on a Tuesday, all organized by Adolf Eichmann, anything between 900 and 3,000 people, mostly in cattle trucks. They were clearly labeled Auschwitz, Sobibor. If you were lucky, you went to Belsenbergen or the occasional one that went to Theresienstadt. And we were there for a whole year, which is an unusual long time, with the Allies now in Arnhem. We were taken um, by train, again, cattle truck, uh, to Theresienstadt. Um, it's a journey that I shall never forget. 39 hours, no sleep, no water, but I remember most of the stench that built up in this cattle truck of human sweat, of vomit, of feces, of urine. You know that the oxygen levels within the cattle truck were dropping, and I remember when it eventually it stopped, 
at Theresien Stadt and they opened the cattle truck door, they slid it open, this great waft of ice cold air came into the cattle truck and you could breathe again. It's like diving into a swimming pool and it's coming up, all in sort of slow motion. Theresien Stadt was yet another transit camp and uh, we were really waiting our time to be taken to the killing fields of the east. But we were at the end of the queue, luckily for us, being on this Bardefeld list. And we were luckily, we were liberated on the uh, 9th of May, 1945, by the, by the Russian army. And the day before that, my mother, returning from the camp hospital where she volunteered to work in unbelievably dangerous um, um, conditions there, where she had hot water and she could wash her children's clothes so that we could keep typhus at bay, and also she would wash adults' clothes and barter that for food to give to her children. And on the returning from that hospital on that, on that 8th of May, um, she was approached by some Russian prisoners of war who were now also in the camp, and they pleaded with her to go into their house, and in their attic, they'd hidden a radio. Would you believe it? A radio. And my mother wrote down on a piece of paper what she heard, and it was Winston Churchill broadcasting from the cabinet war rooms, which is not that far from here, and that the war would be over at midnight that night. That piece of paper is here in the Imperial War Museum. Um, my mother wanted to go to England. She feared there would be nobody left in Holland alive, um, but the Red Cross said, you can't go to England from here because the, Germ the, the um, Russians don't talk to the Brits. There's no communication. They'll have to go to Holland, go to the embassy, and then come to England, which my mother didn't want to do. We were put on the second transport to be sent to Holland, um, I went to a holding camp in a place called Falkenau on the Czech-German borders with my mother still pleading with the Red Cross and they then suggested there was an ambulance with some wounded French soldiers which was going to Pilsen and um, we could go with them to Pilsen. Pilsen was occupied by the Americans and the Americans were talking to the Brits and you might have a chance to be able to get through there. So we went to Pilsen and we arrived there in a DP camp, that's a displaced, displaced person camp a huge hangar lit with arc lights, and it was like moving into hell. I've never seen a place like it of human misery of, of the utmost I've not even witnessed in the camps. It was absolutely, absolutely terrible. And while we were there, uh, my mother um, persuaded uh, through the garrison commander of the, of the, um, the unit there, um, there were two RAF pilots of transport command who flew us uh, completely illegally and purely for humanitarian reasons in an empty cargo plane because they came three times a week there for food for the garrison. They flew us in this empty cargo plane to Croydon Airport, which was then the Heathrow of London, and there the plane landed on the runway and the, uh, they opened the door. Um, we got out, uh, the, 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 the props were still running, they closed the door and they taxied away. They were obviously going back, I think to Manchester, I think, to refuel and to reload for the next trip. And there we were standing on the runway of Britain's major airport, and you'd think someone would come along and say, what the devil are you doing here? But nobody came. And then another airplane landed, and a whole lot of people got out. And luckily for us, it turned out to be Brits who had been interned in Europe when war was declared, couldn't get back, and now they were coming home. And we just joined them. So I always say in a funny sort of way that I'm a bit of a, an illegal immigrant. Um, and we then got onto a coach which took us from Croydon Airport straight across London to Stanmore, where the RAF reception centre was, and we went straight through and we saw the enormous amount of damage that had been done, you know, the blitz, uh, of which we knew absolutely nothing uh, at all. And there we were at the RAF reception centre, my mother was being interviewed, and while we were there, something happened and you know, the theme has been said before is one day. And this one day, this was one day, one happy day I want to tell you about. Because while we were there, like all government organizations, there's always a policeman there. This old boy had obviously been brought out of retirement to do his bit. And there he was with these three scraggly little boys. And he taught us our first English, which was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then he gave us each sixpence, which is about a pound in today's money. And that was the first time that a policeman in a uniform had said anything kind to me in five years. And that is why 
This country is so very, very special to me and many others too. Thank you.